thank you. Um, I was thinking uh, as to what to talk about in this audience because it's uh, such an important conference at a such uh, pivotal time. And, um, you know, I can talk about IPO, I can talk, uh, talk about the exchange, but I was looking at the morning topic and I had a, a, a number of conversations with the people in the mor uh, who spoke, and I really feel that uh, I don't want to go back to my just uh, my own propaganda promotional and you know how great the exchange is, and to trying to see whether I can participate in some of the dialogues uh, that have already taken place and will continue. And I actually much rather wait for the conversation I have with Tara so that we have some interactions. But just uh, make sure that I at least say something to justify the free lunch that I'm taking. Uh, <laughs> I just said, you know, look at the subject, right? You know, U.S. China shaping the future of innovation and technology. And uh, we obviously know we are in difficult times today uh, in terms of uh, Sino-U.S. relations. And uh, the trade today in particular, uh, you know, another round of this uh, uh, insane insanity just took place. It looks like uh, it's not going to, uh, you know, stop anytime soon. And, the, you know, there the, are the all sorts of theories you know, so, you know, trying to essentially trying to articulate why this is happening, what is really the ultimate purpose, and what is the motive behind this, and what are they trying to do, or what anybody is trying to do, and uh, whether or not ultimately this is going to work, whether this is really just about unfair trade, uh, or this is really about uh, you know containing China or whether this is really about trade itself, it's actually, you know, really is about technology, it's really about dominance, and uh, so we don't really know, and I, 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 I don't really particularly contribute much to that particular debate about uh, what is really behind the maneuverings on trade, but I'm just looking at this title <clears throat> to see whether or not the tension that we're seeing here, uh, you, know, in, you know, in the trade context between U.S. and China whether that actually indeed is going to spread over to technology or whether or not it is actually entirely targeted in technology because the last thing, according to this theory, that the U.S. wanted is that the U is China, in addition to great advantages that is already secured in trade, you know, underlying economic development in many other areas where technology really is the last... Uh, red line that cannot be crossed. And, and so therefore this trade and all the effort is essentially trying to reverse the dialogue and reverse the great smooth relationship of the collaboration or the overall theme of collaboration between the two countries into one of a confrontation or at least uh, uh, trying to stop and reevaluate. And I, I guess, um, you, know, you know, I, we, the exchange, you know, uh, basically operating, uh, you know, uh, in, in financial infrastructure. We, you know, we, we usually don't, you know, uh, are not considered to be terribly savvy technology-wise, other than that we have to have a resilient technology, uh, you know, operation to make sure that the trading uh, continues without any, uh, you know, any problems. But lately, uh, as, uh, you know, has been introduced by Tara, that we have done a lot trying to become a lot more relevant in the new space, in innovation, in technology. So I guess all of us are really trying to find our role in this new universe of technology and this new innovation in this digital era. And it's really trying to find how can we contribute, and more importantly, behind the scenes, or at least underneath it, is today how do we benefit from it. And so in that context, we are trying hard to see whether we can smooth it out. But on this trade tension that we currently see, and how that could eventually translate into any action or similar consequences in finance and in technology, is something that I think uh, it's a very interesting topic for us to think about it. My opening proposition is that it's a lot easier to fight a trade war. It's a lot easier to enact a trade barriers, simply because trade itself is physical. Trade itself is real, actual, physical goods that need to be moved back and forth. And it can be stopped. It's almost like a, you know, it's almost like a people, like a border. 
like a war between U.S. and Mexico. You can actually build a wall. Obviously, Mexico hasn't paid yet, and they haven't really put any down payment yet. I guess I think they're still negotiating on the down payment、uh, before they can get the construction crews on that. But you can actually build a wall if you really want it. China built a wall 2,000 years ago, and、uh, an area of you know in trade probably can be enacted. But as of somebody who have worked in finance for 20 some years now, but especially in light of what we are doing today. I find it increasingly hard to believe that somehow in finance you can build walls and barriers as easily as you can with trade, because at the end of the day, money is fungible. At the end of the day, money flows to where value is created, and money is going to go where the returns is going to be, and you can try to hold them back, and you try to do whatever you want it, but ultimately, it is you know water is going to flow. From the mountains to the oceans, you can stop them. You can build a big dam, but when the dam is filled, you still have to let the water go. So that's just physics. So I don't really think anybody can really truly build a wall, a barrier in financing. I mean, obviously, China, you know, ironically, you know, is the only biggest economy today that still maintain a very strong. And reasonably effective capital control, for a lot of reasons that we don't really need to debate as to whether or not they're justified and whether they're not right. Is a big country, has a lot of issues, had a lot of challenges, and is still yet today can't afford, at least in accordance with the current decision and the views of the current decision makers, and、uh, that is not yet ready to break down that wall, break down that barrier. But even that, we see so many changes. We see so much that has taken place. Just barely looking at our little universe, and、uh, you know, you all know, back,、um, you know, the initial capital flow started with the companies making the journey. Back in the early 90s, China doesn't have a you know capital market. Hong Kong has a small capital market, and U.S. market is the only market. That really are able to provide any financing. So at that time, it is the companies, the issuers, who travel thousands of miles and go to the U.S. and do roadshows and do deals. And then the Hong Kong market becoming a very easy place for them to be. So they no longer have to cross the ocean; they just need to cross the Shenzhen River. So they came over in Hong Kong. We become a very big capital formation center, but that still required them to come over. So that's really the Hong Kong's first. Business prop, prop, proposition for the last 25 years. That is, the Chinese companies come to Hong Kong, international money flow to Hong to Hong Kong, and then being taken up into China. <clears throat> But in the last five years, you have read that now increasingly, people wanted to international investors also want to invest into China. <clears throat> But in a way that is consistent and familiar. With their own practices and trading habits and trading cultures, the brave ones already went in there in Q fee, in R Q fee. But the ones who really wanted to go but don't really want to make the jump, wanted to find a way to do so. Correspondingly, the Chinese wanted to put their money out of China and put it into diversifications and in Hong Kong first, and maybe over time later. So I think they really have that need. So we built Stock Connect. So essentially, Chinese can sit in China and invest in Hong Kong underline, and conversely, international investors are able to sit in Hong Kong and you know in directly invest through Hong Kong exchange into the domestic market. That's called a stock connect. We expanded that to bond last year, called a bond connect. So again, even with the most interesting and strongest capital control was. We are able to find ways to get both the regulators to be comfortable, at the same time allow capital to flow more freely, and、uh, then obviously, with the technology, with innovation, we start to really face another very big issue that we almost began to repeat, you know, four years ago, five years ago, Alibaba again had to repeat the journey that many of the Chinese. Listed issuers' predecessors have to go many years ago, 20 years ago, 
because somehow in Hong Kong we are not able to accommodate to that type of companies and they have to travel to the United States again. And many of them did, and many of them are still doing it. And in order for us to think back 25 years ago, what we did that we actually allowed all these people who have a natural inclination to be here and then so that they don't have to travel far. Many of them still want to travel far because there are special things in the U.S. that they wouldn't otherwise be able to get here or somewhere else. And then good luck and continue travel. But otherwise, if you are going to, you really prefer to be here, but there are certain things that we have here that are not making it easy for us to welcome you, we will change. That's what we did. That's the reform that you have heard. That reform now essentially allowed many new economy companies to come, and we're building a pipeline that uh, we, um, the like of which we have never seen. I'm borrowing you know, uh, Donald's words here. Um, so that's really a very, very big, uh, big jump. Then again, we're repeating something in part of the technology or innovation is about biotech. The biotech companies used to also have to travel to NASDAQ. Now they are able to do it here. So all of these changes we're making is to essentially take out not the physical barriers or borders or walls or barriers, but capital barriers or regulatory barriers or trading habit barriers. So once we have done that, as you can see today, you know, Tara talked about all the listing applications, all the strong pipelines, I think we're going to see a fantastic year. Obviously, the secondary market is not that, you know, uh, accommodating today. There are a lot of uncertainties. This trade war is creating so much anxiety in the market. Not necessarily people think all oh, hell is going to break loose. Actually, very few think all oh, hell will break loose. But with the trade war in its peak, nobody wants to venture into anything. So it's really about people finding the market directionless, finding the market unsettled, and people are simply just standing on the sideline. But we still see issuers continue to be coming because they have strategic decisions to make, they have business competition to worry about, and they have to, they sometimes decided to come to market for valuation, other times they come to market for their own strategic or uh, competitive needs. So we are always open. The key distincting, distinctive characteristic of Hong Kong market is that we are open all the time, no matter what. But obviously, you know, when issuers come here, you will find the receptiveness different, you know, every time. So that's really capital. It's very, very hard to really block the flow of capital. And I think America and China, in that scenario, no matter what we do in trade, from a financial perspective, from a money perspective, we are interconnected. At least China is the biggest creditor of America, unless Americans decided not to want to pay back that, you know, that big debt, we have to do business together. There's not a whole lot you can do because, again, again, the proposition is so hard to block money. Now, looking that if the trade war was launched and was conducted for the ultimate purpose of denying China the technological advancement that it has set its eyes on, is that going to work? How realistic that is actually going to stop China from reaching it? Or whether or not America is served better by blocking China, that advancement in technology and innovation. And I think uh, the case can be argued with even greater effectiveness that technology is even harder. By, uh, you know, uh, innovation, technology, and it's very, even harder for you to build barriers. Because in the end, technology, innovation are ideas. Are ideas up in people's head. In people's head, they talk. Even if you don't allow enough Chinese students to get degrees in the US, even if you do not allow a lot of PhD students from returning to China to conduct business, you cannot stop people from talking, of sharing, Obviously, I'm not talking about people illegally taking intellectual properties and putting it to a disk and then, you know, ship it back and then fund another company with it. I'm, so essentially, innovation is beyond human and, you know, beyond country. 
beyond culture, beyond borders. And uh, you know, in the three key areas of innovation that we are seeing that is really engulfing our lives, is really one is you know, uh, biotech, second is uh, social media, and then you know, you know, e-commerce and all this other economic or you know, payment systems. So essentially, innovation are all there, pretty much to do a number of things. All this e-commerce, all this uh, you know, um, payment systems, just make us feel richer, make us feel that our life is better. All the advancements in biology, in biotech, in the biotech sector make us look, live healthy. All the social media make us feel happier. I'm not sure completely true that we are all happier because we have uh, Facebook and, uh, and all of that. I don't know. I mean, you know, you know uh, as you can all pr personal experience, you know, I, I just went, came back from holiday with the kids. Every time we sit down in a restaurant, just after a few exchange of pleasantry, everybody starts to look at their phones now. And occasionally, we actually send, you know, you know our family's WeChat group is called a Lee Clan. So people just send messages into Lee Clan, and we are seeing each other while sitting next to each other. So I'm not sure social media necessarily make us, uh, 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 you know, feel better, but I think it does make us feel better because the simple test is that you ask people to give up your phone and see whether or not they're going to tell you, oh, actually, I would be happier without my phone. So. So if that's the case, if innovation technology in the end is all about making our life healthy, making our economic life feel richer, making our emotional life feel better, we're not going to stop it. We're not going to say you know, that um, you know, we can deny this technology, that technology, therefore you cannot really uh, you know, make a big difference. In fact, in many ways, America and China have so much to benefit from each other, in particularly in this new space. You, if you argue in the old economy, in trade, in manufacturing, it's a zero-sum game. If China is becoming the manufacturing center of the world, then that means a lot of job is going to migrate from America. And if you think that's a zero-sum game, and if you don't like it, at least there is some argument that you can feel that uh, you can feel rightfully outraged. But I don't know how you can possibly see a barrier between China and US in innovation, in technology, is going to make anybody better, or feel better, or healthier. In biotech, whether you're white, you're brown, you're yellow, your blood is the same, your liver is the same, your kidney is the same, all the, you know, all the drugs is the same. I don't really think there's a drug for Chinese and there's a drug for Africans. We all going to eat the same antibiotics. And China and America is such an important two big population that allow biotech to work. Biotech really need to work in America and need to work in China. Need to work in America because America is where you can afford the most expensive drugs and you probably want to have the most expensive drugs because you have so many doctors to support. So there, you know, you essentially, that deep pocket in America is the guarantee of research development. They're ultimately going to identify new treatment, new drugs, new, you know, uh, you know everything. They ultim ultimately make American life better and I'm sure will make Chinese life better. You also need China with that population, with the rising you know, middle class. We need drugs on a massive scale. And we need medical health care services in a way that has never been seen globally. And all the American drugs, that once you lost the patent, once you become a generic drug, when all the population of China and India can start to benefit, that drug will have another life. That's why you will see a lot of pharmaceutical companies doing something that they have never done. Because all the big pharmaceutical companies in the past is just buying up research 
you know, look at the companies that with great promise of drugs because they need to build the pipeline of the drug. The whole idea is that one drug needs to be a $5 billion sell in order for that company to work. So the drug companies is all about killer drugs. And therefore, we have great innovation that ultimately identify and find medical solutions for all human beings. But when Americans, when the patent is gone, that need to be popularized. And China is the best middle class market that are able to do that, and India is right behind it. So I think biotech, tremendous amount of collaboration, tremendous amount of mutual help. And I think that's why China finally changed its drug administration policy and is essentially aligned all its drug approval process with the US and EMU, uh, Europe. So now the reason we are able to launch a biotech chapter in our listing is precisely because all the regulatory regimes are pretty much aligned and we are able to rely on those regime to really approve and vet applications for listings here. But if you move beyond biotech, if you into social media, social media probably is the most politically controversial because they are, you know, they are content restrictions still, and uh, you know, uh, American is reasonably content free. But today, obviously, with all the election, with Russian hacking, with all the privacy and issues, I think uh, big U.S. tech is under a lot of pressure itself. But but if that's the case, you still think social media completely flat the barrier of all communications. If you still don't like the fact Google is, in China, is not in China and Facebook is not in China, you should know that people today in China, they don't have Facebook, they don't have Google, they have something pretty similar. Obviously, there are differences. I'm not denying the magnitude of the differences. But if you look at social media, if you look at the technology innovation that have happened in China, if you look at the benefit that has brought to the Chinese population in terms of its own enlightenment, its knowledge, its insightful, its information, its understanding of international affairs, you never see any population that is us connected, us feeling us emotionally related with Americans or with anybody outside China. And that is only going to become, that earth is only going to become flatter and flatter and flatter. And there's no way that any efforts by government to build barriers is going to make people feel even if you less communicated. They may not like it exactly. There are many things that drive people nuts and drive people crazy, both in China and in America. But I do think in the end, ideas, communication, information are not able to be really blocked. You know. So finally, looking at uh, even more revolutionary and disruptive technologies that are coming ahead of us. Look at AI. Look at com uh, and, you know, computing. Look at data mining. Look at data itself. I think in that, I would argue that America and China probably even need each other even more. Because America, obviously, with all the universities, all the PhDs, all the policies supporting innovation and freedom of information, freedom of ideas, and will always be on the cutting edge of technology advancement. But China today, China's backwardness, China's inadequacy in terms of retail services, financial services, healthcare services, all of these things in China will turn out to be China's most important assets, simply because the backwardness of many of those services. China is the only major market that are able to essentially embrace the new forms of economy faster, bigger than anybody, and certainly than America. Healthcare, for example. I would bet that China's healthcare, healthcare will very quickly be digitalized. And if China is able to digitalize its medical services, essentially, if we are able, China is probably more digitalized in its patient's records services than, you know, than anybody else. It's still in very many different pockets, but it's already digitalized. And I bet that we are going to be much faster than America to have a national digitalized 
medical industry. What does that mean? That means that one day, as long as privacy is able to be maintained, regulatory system need to be established, we will become a system that can deliver health care better than America. Just a simple example. If everybody are able to put your MAR, MRA files online into, a, you know, into various pockets that can be shared with protection, privacy protection and everything else, every hospital start to build an AI that is able to read hundreds of thousands of MRs and be able to train the deep learning of the AI machines, you will actually in China probably one day see more doctors who look at your MRA and say, you're most likely going to be that problem rather than that problem. And also, we have looked at all the people who have this problem and who have received different treatments, and here's the statistics, and we actually believe you probably belong to that category. I think we probably, China, is able to do that much faster than America. So all the advancements that are achieved in U.S. can be used in China because China's, you know, will provide a massive data mine a massive universe of raw data that can provide the business case for a lot of the applications of new technology. And all of that will turn out back and help American business, help American healthcare, health, help American in general life. So I think this is not an area. So innovation, technology, particularly in the future of data. Data China, again, because of, again, the backwardness is likely going to potentially leapfrog. Because today, the massive e-commerce platforms, so many numbers of them, so large size of them, their business generate so much data. Their business is not to generate data. Their business is making money on their own, but the byproduct is the massive data, and that data properly equipped it with computing powers, will provide worldwide AI capabilities to combine with that data. We all know that all this AI in, in, in deep learning, this is all 20, 30 years old you know, creativity uh, or uh, uh, innovation we already found. But it's never going to be put into any real use until two big things happen. One is massive data, avail availability of massive data to computing powers. And these two things were not possible 20 years ago, not 10 years ago, not even five years ago. But with Moore's law, it is now finally around the corner. So we, you know, we are going to be seeing innovation, and we're going to be seeing the new universe probably so fast and so close that unless, other than some little apprehension as to exactly how that is going to reshape our lives as we know it, it's all supposed to be good news. Good news for our health, good news for our life, good news for our emotional being. So my final thought is again to say, if we, want, if we, have, to, if we have to fight a trade war, let's do it. Let's figure out how far that gets us. But I don't think we can fight a finance war. I certainly don't think we can ever fight a real technology war because that's just not going to get us anywhere. Thank you.